This presentation is brought to you by American Civil War and UK History. This is the Figures of the American Civil War podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Daz, and in today's episode, I'm joined by historians Dr. Nathan Prokos and Tim Wilgin to discuss one of the most famous generals in American and world history. The man in question will start life in Point Pleasant, Ohio, and will eventually rise to the rank of Lieutenant General and then in 1866, General, which was the first time in the US since George Washington. He will be elected as the 18th President of the United States of America in 1869 and would serve two terms. Of course, we are going to be discussing none other than Ulysses S. Grant. In this first episode, myself and my guests discuss Grant's early life and everything in between right up to just before the start of the American Civil War. This is the Figures of the American Civil War podcast, Ulysses S. Grant, Episode 1. Hello and welcome everyone, and remember if you're watching on YouTube to hit that subscribe button, and uh, you will find all the links to our website, our podcasts, and social media pages in the podcast description. What was a life like in the 19th century or the early 19th century around the time Grant was born? So we'll co I'll come to you first, Nate, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that, please, mate. Yeah, Grant was born into what was known as the era of good feelings. Uh, there was a lot of national pride and purpose following the War of 1812. Uh, before 1822, the United States uh, purchased the Louisiana Territory uh, just 19 years prior. Furthermore, the British impressment and support for uh, Native American raids into American lands uh, simply just created more conflict within the United States at the time, uh, prompting the War of 1812. And only a couple of future uh, American Civil War leaders remembered this war, such as Winfield Scott, uh, Admiral Farragut. Uh, the results of this war ended with similar borders, but Politically, it had greater repercussions, such as the Democratic Party grew out of this, this particular event. I'm speaking more about Andrew Jackson being the catalyst for such events and winning multiple that battles, primarily the Battle of New Orleans. And he's going to be elected president in 1828. Grant's father was actually a supporter of Andrew Jackson, probably because he could relate to this ordinary man that Andrew Jackson was able to, to present to the public. And Jesse Grant came to resent later on the Democrats party for its later support and expansion of the slave institution. But Northern States began abolishing slavery, uh, really around that same time on the basis of religious and economic reasons as Southern states became more and more dependent upon it uh, for those same reasons. The era of good feeling surely pulled the populace together after the War of 1812, but it was quite temporary as the political issue of slavery was just pulling at its seams. And Jesse Root Grant and his wife, Hannah Simpson Grant, favored the abolitionist cause before Grant was even born uh, in Point Pleasant, Ohio. Okay, let's let's look at the family background in general. So um, please describe a little bit about Grant's parents. Uh, so Grant begins uh, his memoirs quite beautifully. He says, my family is American and has been for generations in all its branches, direct and collateral. He did not begin with his ethnic or cultural background from Europe. Rather, he began with his family's beginnings in the Americas, starting uh, with his descendant, Matthew Grant. He had family members that fought in the French and Indian War, uh, while also claiming his grandfather, Noah Grant, fought in the American Revolutionary War, although I should probably say there's no evidence that says he was in the American Revolution, but there's nothing that says he wasn't. So it's a bit up in the air. There's no record. Um, yeah, there's just simply no record that proves this claim. And his family name is most likely Scottish, which is addressed by 
someone later, uh, another biographer of Grant, PC Headley. And of course, when, when Grant um, later went on his world tour, when he went to Scotland, Clan Grant actually accepted him as one of their own. And talking more a little bit about where Grant was born and, and his, his father and his parents, um, he's, he's not born into a wealthy family or aristocratic background. His mother, Hannah Simpson Grant, was actually known as very quiet, very reserved. His father, the exact opposite of that. And this middle-class family in Point Pleasant, Ohio, uh, was living quite quite well in, in 1822. Uh, there's not too much known about Grant's early life, and much of it is legend being told by historians later on. For instance, that same historian I mentioned, uh, P.C. Headley, he, he lists one account of Grant shooting a gun when he was just an infant, but, you know, there's no evidence, other evidence of this. And there's, of course, other accounts of him protecting other boys getting bullied in his youth. And uh, what we do know is that he did love horses. He, he loved horses. And there is more evidence probably to this story uh, that he went to his father because he wanted to borrow money to go get a horse from one of his neighbors. And when Grant showed up to his neighbor's house, he told his neighbor uh, that I'm, you know, to first offer you, you know, $15. If you won't take that, I'll offer you 20. And if you won't take that, I'll, you know, give you 25. So Grant ultimately got the horse for $25 because he's terrible at negotiation in his youth. But the story is very anecdotal, uh, and it plays into Grant's naive sensibilities. However, we have to remember that Grant also was a child, <laughs> so I don't expect Grant to understand, understand negotiation or uh, being able to use money well in this in this period of time. Uh, Nevertheless, as, as Ulysses got older, he actually began working in his father's tannery. That's actually how his father uh, was able to make quite a bit of money. Uh, that's why they lived pretty pretty comfortably, even when uh, Jesse Grant moved to Galena, Illinois. They had uh, a small store uh, with items that were made in a tannery. Um, but... Grant worked in this in this tannery when he was just a boy, and uh, he actually came to abhor the sight of blood because obviously in a tannery you're going to see that. And later on in his life, he would only eat meat basically if it was burnt. Uh, he didn't want it to be rare. He didn't really. I'm sure it reminded him of working in the tannery. Uh, but quite frankly. His upbringing was really nothing less than boring and uneventful. That is until Ulysses' father saw an opportunity for the young Ulysses to attend the highly renowned uh, West Point Academy in New York. And Grant had no desire to really attend this prestigious school. But of course, in the, in the time period, you, you do what you're told. Yes, exactly. And yeah, a uh, tannery must have been a horrible place to grow up. I can imagine that being the case of uh, putting you off eating meat or, yeah, like you just described as fantastic uh, bit of information there. Um, but um, I, I must ask, did Grant possess any early strengths or abilities as a young man? And what were some of his faults? And uh, this question is to both of you, but I'll start with you, Nate. Yeah, it, it... It's difficult to say before his attendance at West Point, just again, largely because so many of these stories are anecdotal and it's difficult to distinguish what is true and what simply came later. Um, but we do know he had a disdain for blood and he loved horses. If anything, this actually speaks to a more gentle nature in Grant. He was, he was quiet and unassuming like his mother. Um, he 
most likely didn't have the greatest relationship with his father, but there's no way of, of legitimately knowing that. It is quite possible that one of his weaknesses simply was he didn't stand out. Uh, there was nothing brilliant or unique about his character. Uh, and just a few examples going off of that, I mean, in uh, the Duke of Wellington in his youth, he wasn't brilliant, but he was an assuming figure getting in trouble. And, you know, there were many stories about his mother not believing in him. And he he definitely caused a lot of mischief. So he is at least bringing on attention to himself. And even Napoleon, he was a lonely child. He was a lonely boy, especially at school. But they knew he was brilliant. He was, he was, he was simply intellectually a genius for that matter. And this speaks very differently than, than Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, I would just simply say that Grant had a very happy, not exciting childhood. And, and this is quite rare to have such a beginning for someone that would later be responsible for <laughs> commanding hundreds of thousands of men. Um, Tim, do you want to add anything to that, mate? So uh, Nate uh, touched on the story about Grant purchasing the horse for more than he, his father had originally intended or for the maximum amount his father would allow because he couldn't negotiate. That would be something that Grant would struggle with uh, throughout his life and business ventures. So in a sense, that's a fault. Um, but in other sense, he was uh, one time when he was 12 years old or so, he was supposed to go pick up a load of timber. The people he was supposed to pick it up from weren't there. The timber was, but the people weren't. So instead of going home empty handed, you know, in Grant's military life, he would state that he hated nothing so much as retracing his steps. He also didn't like coming back empty handed. So he unhitched his horses, pulled them aboard the wagon one log at a time. He was also, uh, you know, aware of himself and had a, a quiet confidence. Um, he was supposed to escort two w ladies across a, you know, was taking them home or something like that. Came to a swollen stream. The ladies were super freaked out. Grant was so confident with him in himself. And especially since he was working with horses at the time, uh, and confident in his horses that he was like, don't worry, ladies, uh, I'll get you across safely. Um, so I think that speaks to his resolve, um, his self-awareness, confidence. Um, so while quiet and I'm assuming it was there. Okay, so how does Grant's life compare to other future Civil War generals at the time? So we'll start with you, Nathan, if you don't mind, please, mate. I really hate doing this in the first episode, uh, but I have to bring up Robert E. Lee here, who is Grant's adversary later on in the Civil War. Uh, Robert E. Lee, he's going to come from an aristocratic Southern family uh, in, in Virginia. And while they were very well known, they did struggle a bit more financially with money. Uh, that's primarily due to the fault of his father, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee, who was a veteran of the American Civil War. He squandered the family's wealth and, and died while Robert E. Lee was quite young. And Lee is actually going to grow up in the care of his mother and another close relative. Uh, Lee will attend an all-boys school and, and did quite well in mathematics. And Ulysses certainly did well, well in mathematics, uh, but he does not have that same social status as Lee. Lee does have a more assuming authority when he is when he is much younger. Uh, but Lee also has different troubles than Grant, such as the loss of his father and and dealing with um, a poor financial background. Uh, Grant's friend William Sherman was also born in Ohio just two years before Ulysses. Unfortunately. Sherman's father died when Sherman was only nine years old and without any inheritance left to Sherman's mother, he was sent to live with the Ewing family 
uh, that he would later marry into. But again, Sherman probably has more similarity with Robert E. Lee than he does Grant at this point in time. Um, but then there's Phil Sheridan. He's born about a decade after and is quite possible he actually wasn't even born in the United States. He might have been born on the, a ship that was going from Ireland to New York City. His family consisted of Irish immigrants and Sheridan was some, much more of a troublemaker and, and starting fights. His mother did not view him as a good child and, and look to his brothers for success. Therefore, a lot of the future heroes of the Civil War were some of the unlikeliest heroes, quite frankly, of the 19th century. Because you have, you have other Confederate generals that showed quite a bit of promise due to their wealth and social status, like Wade Hampton, Joseph E. Johnson, Beauregard, and even Jefferson Davis. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, so um, you mentioned some of the other Civil War generals there, and one place they uh, they do attend a lot of these generals is West Point. And, of course, you know, Nate's brought up West Point. So, Tim, how does Grant get accepted into West Point, and what is the story behind that, please? So, he went to West Point because of his father. Now, his father desired a professional education for Grant. Um and particularly one at government expense. But in order to go to West Point uh, back then, you had to be nominated uh, by a congressperson uh, who had a number of slots at the academy um, each year or in total. It's changed over time somewhat. And to a degree, you know, it, it's still the same way today. You apply to your congressperson or senator or the president for a nomination. Uh, and then you had to pass the entrance exams, and then you were in. And you took those when you got to the academy. So nomination was the first bit. So his father had been friends with uh, a Democratic congressperson named Thomas Hamer, but they had fallen out in the 1830s um, uh, over political differences. But they both regretted that falling out. And when Jesse uh, wrote to Hamer, um, Jesse was a Whig at the time, but he wrote to Hamer asking for the nomination and uh, Hamer's reaction was basically, sure, I've, I'll send your name up. I see no reason that it won't be accepted and uh, why didn't you write sooner? Um, Grant didn't want to go, but as Nate mentioned, his dad, uh, I think there's a quote, he, Grant would say, he, Jesse, uh, said he thought I would go. And I thought so, too, if he did. So he went with his father's wishes, and I think that's a pretty good uh, mm -hmm. or funny quote. Um, interestingly enough, when he uh, when Hamer made the nomination, he messed up Grant's name. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but Grant was born Hiram Ulysses Grant, so his first name was Hiram. And Hamer made a mistake, and he submitted Ulysses S. Grant. He just assumed that the middle name was Simpson, but that was actually never officially a thing. It was just Ulysses S. Grant. And uh, when he was there at the academy, you know, U.S. also stands for Uncle Sam, and that's how Grant became known as Sam Grant to his Army peers. Um, so that's how Grant ended up at West Point, basically following his father's wishes, even though he was not naturally inclined to uh, military life. Um, and really desired to become a math teacher. Yeah. And so how did he perform in his classes uh, compared to his classmates? He actually has a reputation, I think, is quite undeserved as not being overly intelligent. Uh, but if you look at, his, at the records, in his first year, the, the, his fourth class, or what we would call freshman year, there were 60 new cadets. Uh, Grant finished 26th, yeah, 26th. He was 16th in math and 49th in French. So not so great in French, pretty good in math. It had basically averaged out. And his performance would basically improve every single year. Uh, the very next year, he 
you know, several cadets have dropped, dropped out. But Grant is now sitting at about 20th or sorry, 24th. And he's still doing well in math. He's scored 10th in math. He's still struggling a little bit in French. He's in the top half in drawing. And that basically persisted until your until his senior year, which is somewhat most revealing because that's where you really get into uh, – I mean, you have drill every year at West Point. And, uh, that factors into your demerit totals if you're not very good at it. But your military education really took place in your first class or senior year, as we would call it today. And I think that's somewhat revealing. In total, Grant finished 21st in his class of 39. Um, so just in the bottom half, but just barely. Um, but he did really well in a couple subjects. So he was in the top half in uh, mineralogy and geology, if you're thinking how much Civil War officers or officers of that era had to understand engineering for sieges and siege warfare. Uh, that revealed a bit. He did well in infantry. He was, well, he did okay in infantry. He was 28th. He was 25th in artillery. Actually, I think I may have got that wrong. Yeah, 28th in infantry, 25th in artillery. Uh, he was in the 20s in ethics. Um, but what's really interesting is the, the professor of engineering there was uh, uh, Professor Mahan, Dennis Hart Mahan, I think. And um, he was also a devotee of Napoleon in Germany, uh, who wrote about Napoleon. Uh, he produced you know, he taught this course on engineering, but in that it also was like the art of war. Um, and Grant finished 16th in his class at that. So I think that's quite revealing. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the uh, the um, statistics there on that. And uh, so how does his class standing reflect his ability as a general, would you say, Tim? So I think... Uh, in terms of the infantry artillery classes, those are once again more drill based. So he gets the manual, he understands it. He does better than some. Um, but to me, that's, it, you know, I've interpreted that as, you know, he understands what the material is and can employ it, but he isn't strictly by the book. Um, I think it speaks that as far as his success in Mahan's class or, uh, I think that says a lot. He was not known for, you know, standard interpretation is that Grant wasn't known for theory, but he clearly grasped the principles of war. Uh, perhaps the art of war is, is instructed in these classes. You know, it wasn't just engineering and siege works. It was, um, how to move and conduct armies. And you see that a little bit later, and I know we'll get into it as we discuss his experience in Mexico. He's far more observant. So I think Grant was both more, uh, they, they talk about his common sense. I think that's part of it, but I think he, he did inculcate those lessons learned um, from his time at West Point, particularly under Mahan. You know, and he was at West Point known as the probably the finest horseman at the academy, and that was frequently commented on. And you, you know, that would, you know, riding a horse is a necessity for a Civil War officer to command and control his troops. It gets him out of some scrapes. Um, it gets him in trouble. You know, he's injured during the war when horses fall, but. Um, at other times, he's able to go through impassable terrain, such as on his way to Chattanooga, and I know we'll cover that in a later episode, um, that people are just astounded that he was able to control the horse there. And that's important because his presence was required in Chattanooga. Um, so he didn't learn that horsemanship at the academy, but he definitely employed it there and gained a reputation. Yeah, and again, that goes back to him being that child and, and building that relationship with horses at the time, didn't it? So, yeah, that's fantastic. And so where does Grant go after following his uh, graduation? So um, we'll go to Nate first, 
you want to to answer that, mate? Yeah, he... Grant is going to be assigned to the infantry after graduating from West Point, and Grant actually finds leaving West Point as one of the best days of his lives, uh, as he says. But he's going to be posted to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, Missouri. But this is largely to initially his dismay because he wanted to be assigned to the cavalry, as Tim already mentioned. He was a fine uh, horseman, and I think he would have done exceptionally well in the cavalry, but ultimately, due to his class standing, he was assigned to the infantry there within St. Louis. Tim, would you like to add something to that, mate? Yeah, I, I think it's worth noting, you know, his preference was the cavalry, but actually at that time... Uh, you know, the top of each West Point class, the top five or six, I think it was, which in Grant's class included William B. Franklin, was who would be a uh, corps commander in the Army of the Potomac, eventually Grand Division commander. Uh, he finished first in Grant's class. So he and the first seven or top seven graduates, um, I think all Northerners actually, uh, ended up in the Corps of Engineers. After that, they assigned to the infantry, or to the artillery, sorry, and then to the infantry for kind of the middle. The bottom of the class is actually who ended up in the cavalry. It wasn't the other way around. Um, That's how in 1861, young uh, George Armstrong Custer is the goat of his class, uh, the person who finishes dead last, and he ends up in the cavalry. Um, So Grant actually performed a little too well um, to get his preferred branch of service. Um, And, you know, his class wasn't uber distinguished. You don't have a whole ton of people. Um, For example, when Grant was a fourth classman, the first class included George Thomas and Sherman. Um, And one of the Hebert brothers who would become a, was a, a Confederate general governor of Louisiana uh, finished first in that class. Another finished first a couple years later. Um, but they, uh, other classes had a few more distinguished people. Um, probably the most notable person in Grant's life or, you know, classmate uh, person who become most notable was one of his roommates. And that was uh, uh, Frederick Dent. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, I'm sure. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up, actually. Yeah, so I was going to ask, who is the Dent family? Because they're so important and integral in the story, aren't they? So, Nate, would you like to tell us about that, please, mate? Yeah, uh, really quick. I, I should note that Fred Dent that Tim just mentioned, he's also named after his father, who's also Frederick Dent. Okay, um, So Frederick Dent and Frederick Dent. Okay, Uh, so Frederick Dent, his father uh, and his wife, Ellen, actually had a plantation home right outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And Frederick Dent was known in St. Louis to be this wealthy planter. He owned many slaves. Uh, His son, Fred Dent, attended West Point with Grant and was his roommate. So they got to know each other very, very well. Right. And. When Ulysses was then stationed at Jefferson Barracks, Fred Dent actually told him to go meet with his family since they lived there and they would be very welcoming welcoming towards him. And and, um, they were initially, uh, but, but this changed a bit once Grant and Julia, the daughter of Frederick Dent and Ellen Dent, um, once Grant and Julia started interacting, this this changed quite dramatically. Yeah, so tell us about how they actually become associated with each other. Right. So before Julia Dent actually meets Ulysses, Julia was the eldest daughter of Frederick Dent, and she grew up actually with a very good education. And this probably has to do with their social standing, but... She'll actually attend the Mrs. Morrow's boarding school. And it's not going to be until she returns from the school when she's 17 that uh, she's going to meet 
this young Lieutenant Ulysses uh, visiting her family. Um, and she learns that Ulysses was her brother's roommate at West Point. And as they started talking with each other, they figured out they shared quite a few uh, interests with each other, that being horses. And they became quite fond of one, one another. And they, they both end up falling in love with each other. And Grant continued writing to her even uh, throughout his military career. And this has actually been a great source for historians later on to, to understand Grant's thinking. Um, but he did become frustrated at times with Julia because of how little she wrote back to him. And we don't, we don't know why or under what circumstances that might have been the case. It could have had to do with the fact that uh, she was born with a condition that actually uh, made her have a lazy eye and it might have been difficult for her to write. Uh, but more problematic in their uh, courtship was Julia's father, who did not support Ulysses marriage proposal to Julia, okay? Eventually, he would change his mind and give Julia away, but he initially thought that Julia could do better than marrying a, a military man. Mm -hmm. And so they actually do get married in the end, is that right? Yes, but that's not after a lot of convincing and a lot of writing to each other um, during the Mexican-American War, it, it, it's going to take a lot of convincing on behalf of Grant. And at one point, Frederick Dent even offers Ulysses his an, an, another one of his daughter's hand in marriage, not Julia's, which is quite interesting. But, of course, Ulysses wants to marry Julia. Okay, so something really big and important is going to happen in Grant's life now, and, and all this military training is going to come into use because the Mexican-American War is going to start, isn't it? So, um, yeah. Tim, tell us a little bit about that and, and where Grant ends up and, and what regiment and stuff he ends up in. All right, so Grant is assigned to the 4th U.S. Infantry at Jefferson Barracks, and that's where he meets Julia and you know, gets in with the Dent family. Uh, but round about 1846, as, the, as tensions heat up with Mexico, um, they create what's called an army of observation uh, under General Zachary Taylor. You know, he's a Virginian, uh, he had, but he'd served in the military since uh, the War of 1812. He'd commanded at a location in the upper Midwest known as Fort Snelling, now outside Minneapolis, um, Minnesota. So basically, in, amidst all of this, there's all these tensions regarding, you know, in the aftermath of the Texas Revolution and Texas uh, being set up as a republic. Shortly after that, the talk begins about annexing Texas into the Union. Um, so Grant is sent down with the 4th U.S. Infantry to Corpus Christi to join uh, Taylor's Army of Observation. Um, and then in September of 1846, they start to... Um, you know, Tyler leaves office. He's replaced by James K. Polk, and who's trying to provoke Mexico into a war, basically, over the annexation of Texas. And Grant's there for, for all of this. Um, he will be at Corpus Christi, and then uh, at the mean, in the meantime, you know, the, the Mexicans, um, the part of the discrepancy is where's the, the border, Um the U.S. says it's south of Rio Grande. Um, Mexico doesn't agree. They send a force that basically besieges a U.S. Uh, fort at a place called Fort Texas um, that today is outside the city of Brownsville, Texas. Um, and that basically takes us up to the start of the war with Grant and the 4th U.S. Infantry being located there in a relief expedition to relieve uh, the siege at Fort Texas. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Um, Nate, early engagements? 
would you like to talk about some of those yeah we could we could probably spend a whole other episode talking about these engagements because grant sees a lot of action in the mexican-american war compared to quite a few other union officers at the time later on in the civil war but Grant's going to fight in a series of engagements throughout the Mexican-American War. Uh, he'll display an uncanny ability, uh, showing absolute calm on the battlefield and, and analyzing the terrain, talking about it with others. And in one of the first engagements, he'll exhibit this extraordinary uh, calm when he started being fired upon with the other men of the 4th Infantry, and it's going to, he'll comment on this to letters to Julia and then his, his memoirs. Um, but this was during the Battle of Palo Alto. This was the very first uh, battle in which he experienced. Uh, then at the Battle of Rosaca de la Palma, he's going to lead men out of a hot zone during, during the battle. Uh, he'll begin thinking more about military movements during the Battle of Monterey, which was something like a three-day battle. Um, he'll ride side saddle while under fire. Uh, he'll later take part in Winfield Scott's campaign from Mer Veracruz to Mexico City, surveying actively in some battles while taking on a role as quartermaster in others. However, he does accurately see... Uh, an opportunity to fire upon the Mexicans by placing a cannon on, on top of a tower uh, near Mexico City. And he'll play this political role as well after one of his officers notices Grant firing upon the Mexicans from this tower with a, uh, with a cannon. And so he brings Grant another cannon. And Grant, of course, says, thanks, says thank you and keeps it. But one of the other soldiers tells Grant, why did you accept that? There's not any more room. But Grant said Grant understood the political nature of being within the military at this point in time, and he simply explained, accept what they give you and uh, don't do anything else with that, right? Don't don't question that type of authority. Okay. So Grant understands that and he's so he's understanding the politics of war, he's understanding uh, the terrain, he's he's learning about his own abilities on the battlefield, and now he is becoming this confident and assuming person. I mean, he's he's getting recognized for for those talents. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that he becomes the quartermaster of the uh, of the fourth U.S. Infantry. Is that right? Um, so tell us a little bit about that, right? Uh, Ironically, we, we hear about this, but, but Grant actually did not want to be assigned the role of quartermaster before the Battle of Monterey. In fact, um, he'll actually request to uh, Thomas Hamer to remove him from that post because he wants to take part in the actual fighting. And there's actually an instance where he does leave his uh, post as quartermaster during the, the Battle of Monterey to fall in line with other assaulting columns against the uh, black fort and in, in which only a third of the men or a third of the men were completely obliterated uh, upon entering a clearing and uh, and the Mexicans put a deadly fire upon them. Uh, Brant somehow made it out alive during this event, but he'll make comments about how he has problems with frontal assaults and, and he's totally ignoring his duty as quartermaster at this time. Um, but nonetheless, his position as quartermaster is actually going to serve him quite quite well in the future, uh, fighting the Confederacy. And in fact, J.F.C. Fuller, who is a British military theorist, would later write that if there ever was a gap in generalship between Grant and Robert E. Lee, it was in logistics. And that probably comes in part from his experience as a quartermaster during the Mexican-American War. Yeah, do you know, I've never thought about that before. Yeah, you've really got my brain ticking over now. We're coming up with that. T um, Tim, did you want to add anything to those two points about the, the uh, court master and the, and the early engagements? So it, it's pretty revealing. So Grant does protest to his commander uh, of the 4th Infantry, a guy named Lieutenant Colonel John Garland. 
He states that he uh, does not want any position that, quote, removes me from sharing in the dangers and honors of service with my company at the front. Noticeably, uh, Grant comments on, or uh, Garland in his response, uh, his rejection of Grant's appeal, um, comments on Grant's abilities. He says, Lieutenant Grant is respectfully informed that his protest cannot be considered. Lieutenant Grant was assigned to duty as quartermaster and commissary because of his observed ability, skill, and persistency in the line of duty. The commanding officer is confident that Lieutenant Grant can best serve his country in present emergencies under this assignment. And, you know, in light of a guy who would go on to command large numbers of troops in the Civil War, no assignment, um, and to be honest, I'm speaking somewhat from experience here, um, no assignment could be more valuable in understanding how armies work and what truly makes things tick than his assignment as quartermaster. Um, because while Grant would gain a reputation for his battlefield success, his operational success, no small met part of that is due to his ability to ensure that his troops are able to uh, be strong and well-equipped to be fed and have the, as we would call it, you know, in today's army, uh, beans, bullets, and ammo. You have to have that. You have to have your uh, feet covered. You have to have proper foot gear, clothing. Um, so you'll find later in the Civil War that while Grant may have had a couple setbacks here or there or, or whatnot, his supply issue trains were always expertly handled. Yes, he would have some reverses, but he also get, learned a lot as quartermaster and how to um, to adapt to those. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, how to to live off the land, how to prov provision your force off the land. Um, so a lot of his subsequent fame would be a direct result of the training, in effect, it's training on the job that he received as quartermaster of the 4th U.S. Infantry in Mexico. Yeah, and I think, I think you've answered a lot of the, because the next question was going to be what kind of experiences does Grant take away from the Mexican-American War and how does this help him, obviously, during the American Civil War? You guys have sort of answered some of those questions, but anything to add to that, Nate, about, you know, what experiences he's going to take from that, you know? I think he understands his ability, his, his, his calmness on the battlefield. I think that's going to probably play a... It's going to play a huge role, and especially... Uh, some pretty important battles, such as the Battle of Shiloh. Grant, as soon as the bullets start flying, he can think and see more clearly than a lot of other people can. And this is going to help him get out of some really bad situations. And ultimately, he'll find victory through this, this very important and very rare trait uh, that he possesses. Excellent. And uh, I know we're probably going to talk this further down the line in um, a future episode at some point, but it's always mentioned at Appomattox that Grant remembers Robert E. Lee. And uh, so um, she actually, did they, did they cross paths at them in the, during the Mexican American war? Would you be able to answer that, Tim? They do. Uh, he doesn't specifically mention it in his in his papers at the time, but Lee's very influential, serving under uh, Winfield Scott. So after Monterey Falls, uh, Grant and his unit sent to join Zachary Taylor or uh, Winfield Scott's army. They land at Veracruz. Lee's is, Lee is very influential and gains a very big reputation in leading scouting expeditions ahead of Scott's army. So that's you know it would have been uh, an encounter by reputation. Yeah, so Nate, anything to add to that, Mike? Yeah, I, I was only going to say, and Tim already touched on it, it's when that event transpires at Appomattox, there's a part of me that almost wonders if, if Grant just simply felt awkward about the situation and – and he wasn't sure how to actually begin the conversation. So he realized, I think, that both he and Lee were 
uh, veterans of the Mexican-American War. And I'm sure he remembered that. I'm sure that they, uh, you know, they crossed paths at some point. But I, I believe that was more of a way to get a conversation going between him and Lee about the surrender. So it, even though he brings it up, I mean, ultimately, he's going to, I mean, the reality is he encounters a lot of different generals that will later serve in the Confederacy uh, during the Mexican-American War. And in fact, he actually spends quite a bit of time with some of them, uh, much more so than than Lee. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I suppose it was a way of making him feel at ease as well. Like you said, what was what happens at Appomattox is, is quite upsetting for Lee, isn't it? So yeah, great point there. Um, so, okay, the Mexican-American War ends. And so post-war assignments what happens to grant then obviously you mentioned that he will probably go home and marry his uh, future wife julia dent who will then become his wife obviously but what what's life like for him and what sort of assignments are going to happen after the war for him uh we'll come to you tim okay so i i did want to point out like you know one of the other things that grant uh got out of mexico was you know, he observed different leadership styles. You know, he served under Taylor and Scott. He admired both. Um, he admired Scott and his ability to, you know, break his free of his supply line, live off the land. But in terms of his personal leadership style, and he learned a lot about leadership from both, but personal style, he learned probably more and associated with Taylor. Taylor didn't, Grant was never one for a pomp and circumstance of uniform dating back to his time as a cadet. Taylor was rather, I wouldn't say disheveled, but wore unorthodox uniform, straw hat, unbuttoned coats, stuff like that. And Grant would emulate that style. You know, and, and to a degree, Grant was somewhat victimized by the Mexican-American War in the sense that, you know, he was a relatively new officer. That's, a, a, you know, you're actually doing the job during the war. And you go into a peacetime army and it's a lot more mundane and boring. Um, a lot more emphasis on just discipline for the sake of discipline. And Grant, that was one of the aspects that Grant really didn't like the tedium um, and stuff. So the 4th Infantry was basically sent to a series of posts, to garrison series of posts stretching from Detroit, Michigan to uh, Plattsburgh, New York. The headquarters was basically, though, in Detroit, and that's where a quartermaster was most needed, but they had a new commanding officer. It was a guy named uh, Colonel William Whistler was uh, um, the command of the uh, commander of 4th U.S. Infantry. He, Taylor had relieved him in Mexico and sent him home, and once the 4th was back, he reassumed command. He did not get along with Grant. There was some spite there. Whistler sent Grant to a place called Sackett's Harbor, um, uh, New York, which is on western New York on Lake Ontario. It's very run down. Uh, the barracks is actually named Madison Barracks was the name of the post that he had in Sackett's Harbor. Uh, Grant really didn't like it, but he would basically bounce back and forth between there and um, Detroit for a couple of years until 1849 and the news of of gold comes, uh, Golden California comes. So the fourth is basically sent to garrison uh, postings on the West Coast. Um, Julia at that time is uh, pregnant with, I think their second or third son, it's Ulysses Jr. she's pregnant with. And Grant elects to leave her behind. And it's very fortuitous that he she, he makes that decision because on the way to uh, California, they go by way of Panama, um, you know, cut across, pick up a ship on the other side. Uh, um, there's a big cholera epidemic, and Grant plays a role in setting up field hospitals. And since people, some people don't want to do, perform manual labor and caring for the sick, Grant actually takes on the role of nurse and is commended for his actions there. Um, but then he continues on to California, um, where he will perform his quartermaster duties. He'll try to run a few business ventures, none of which will be successful. Um, and he's also then posted 
you know, because you bounce around a lot. You know, today people move every few years in the military, but back then you're moving sometimes every few months. And he's posted up to Oregon. Um, and it's there while, you know, basically through boredom that Grant will start to, he really had not been a drinker before that, but he'll start to drink on the side and that will begin to affect his performance. Mm -hmm. And Nate, would you like to add anything about his uh, post-war assignments? Yeah, there's only uh, a couple things I, I want to add here. And that is the first being that, that Grant probably is not performing is exceptionally as he did in the Mexican American War. As, as Tim mentioned, it was, it was his role during peacetime, but Grant was someone that truly believed in a Republican army and in terms of having a volunteer force. Um, he did not believe in, you know, having a large standing army uh, during peacetime. So I'm sure that there were some issues between his own politics and uh, beliefs about the professional army as well in terms of discipline. I mean, if we go back to his West Point days, he's hoping that West Point actually gets shut down when there's a bill passed to stop its funding. That, you know, ultimately Grant has his opinions about a professional standing army. And this, and this boredom will impact him. Uh, in a negative way. The only action that's really taking place is between uh, the United States military and Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest. And and Grant actually says at one point or another, the only people really causing problems with the natives are us. Uh, the natives aren't doing anything. They're, they're peaceful. Um, so this is, this is a pretty extraordinary comment uh, that Grant makes at the time. But the politics that he's born into and the environment in which he is experiencing is, I believe, I believe it transforms his own decisions made within the military during his peacetime service. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned the drinking part there, Tim, um, and it's something that's going to come back and haunt his memory later on, isn't it? Um, in a way, um, as we know, when it when you get into the, you know, there, there's going to be that lost, uh, lost cause mythology um, about his drinking, and it's mentioned a few times. You know, um, I don't know whether it's mentioned during the Civil War itself. I think the papers grab hold of it a couple of times, don't they? Um, especially the Southern papers. Um, but yeah, so he he goes into this drinking uh, thing, and so does he get like uh, sent home, or does he get disbanded from the army? What happens there? So. Grant is uh, promoted to captain on October 5th, 1853. He was assigned to command Company F of the 4th Infantry at a place called Fort Humboldt, California. And Fort Humboldt is uh, near what's now the town of Eureka, California, in northwest California, pretty close to the Oregon border. So as far as California goes, that's like the sticks. It's right there on the Pacific. It's remote. He is bored. He's uh, under the command of a guy named, he arrives in uh, beginning of January, 1854. Uh, his commanding officer is a guy named Robert C. Buchanan, the Lieutenant Colonel. Um, Grant had met him at Jefferson Barracks. But due to the remote duty, the tedium, uh, the boredom, Grant begins to drink. And <clears throat> On uh, one occasion, you know, Buchanan reprimands Grant and basically tells Grant that he should uh, reform or resign. Uh, Grant says that he'll do so, and then shortly thereafter, Grant was found influenced but not incapacitated by alcohol. Uh, but true to his word, Grant then resigns. There is no court-martial, no charges are preferred against Grant, um, and Grant leaves um, with the War Department actually stating uh, that nothing stood against his good name. So that's how Grant leaves the Army. He's not under charges or under arrest, not court-martialed, just he resigns based on, you know, the, the struggle he's having with boredom and the resulting uh, use of alcohol. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And again, part of that is because he's missing his family, isn't it? So that that's that as well, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. Um, Nate, anything to add to that just before we move on to the next topic? Yeah, well, and this is something we'll address later on, but it, it's these these charges will actually have an or this resignation will have a negative impact later on during his uh, military career in the American Civil War as there will be some accusing him of drunkenness during during battles, which is not going to be the case. Uh, there's this exaggeration about his drinking that stems from this episode, but the the sources that bring this up is just not something that is truly accurate and is highly, highly exaggerated. But nevertheless, it should be known that he's never drunk during a battle uh, in the future during the Civil War. Excellent. Thanks for adding that. Um, OK, so he goes back to civilian life. And uh, let's just say it doesn't go very well, does it, Tim? So tell us what happens and, and the ventures he tries to get himself involved in and, and, and ultimately just sort of fails at, really. That's all you can say, isn't it? Right. So Grant is 32 in 1854 when he gets back to St. Louis. His dad um, was not a big fan of Julia's family, given his anti-slavery tendencies and Julia the dense pro-slavery uh, tendencies. He offers Grant uh, the opportunity to come work with him in Galena, Illinois, uh, but mandates that Julie either stay with the Grants in Kentucky or with uh, her family in Missouri. Julie and uh, Ulysses reject that offer. They work, uh, he works a piece of uh, farm property with uh, Julia's slave John, named John. Uh, on her brother's, uh, on his brother-in-law's property in, in Missouri, at a uh, property was called Wish Ton Wish, near St. Louis. Uh, the farm was not successful, and to earn a little bit of uh, money, alternate living, so to speak, Grant would sell firewood on the street corners in St. Louis. And in 1856, he moved on to a land onto land owned by his father-in-law, uh, Frederick Dent, uh, and he built a home called Hard Scrabble, where he also tried to make it as a, you know, it's a very appropriate name. He tried to make it um, farming again, uh, but was also unsuccessful. The family was constantly struggling with poverty. Uh, they had a little money. The dwelling was very ramshackle, definitely not what Julia, who had grown up in a wealthy family, was, was used to, but she didn't seem to, you know, there isn't much record of her complaints about that. Grant was certainly more aware of that, um, but he was not well off at all. In fact, in 1857, he had to pawn his gold watch in order to buy uh, Christmas presents for his family. Um, he ended up in 1858 running out of his farm um, and he basically gave up farming. He tried to make it in the insurance business, didn't do very well at that. Um, so finally after you know five, six years of, of struggle, he takes up his father's father's offer to move to Galena. Julia is allowed to go with him so he'll head to Galena, Illinois, uh, basically due east of Dubuque, Iowa, uh, relatively close to the Mississippi River. will work in his father's tannery, which he had always detested, hated the smell of the place, um, and will be renting a, a house in Galena, and will be trying to, to get back on his feet there. Hi. Nate, anything to add to that, Mike? Yeah, just in regards to his uh, political views at the time, what's interesting and what I noted before was that uh, Ulysses' father was an abolitionist, and that's why his parents didn't attend his, his wedding with Julia, because Julia's parents uh, were slave owners. And this speaks volumes about Grant's character, at least around this time period, which is simply that Grant did not hold those abolitionist views that his father certainly did because 
he was still okay with marrying into a slave owning family. Uh, ultimately, uh, at one point, he did have ownership of an enslaved person. He did uh, free them um, without without payment. Um, but at this point in time, we could probably speculate that Grant was something like a Northern Democrat of some of some kind, having similar views of his uh, father-in-law to to an extent. Uh, there's record of him attending a know nothing party, which uh, they were against immigration. Uh, uh, they were against immigrants coming into the country, but that really didn't make. That's the only evidence we have of Grant being associated with that party is just attending one meeting. Uh, but otherwise, Grant's opinions are changing um, as the country is slipping deeper and deeper into civil unrest uh, over the issue of slavery and there's there's some record of Ulysses working alongside enslaved people there's there's a lot of different stories that take place and and different historians have made different claims but ultimately the way that I interpret Grant's own views at the time is is he was someone that felt very neutral about the institution of slavery. He didn't necessarily see it as like this horrible evil, like his father, that they needed to get rid of it right away. Uh, but he also was not someone that believed in its, its expansion or um, its persistence. And this his decision to move to Galena will, and, and his decision to join the Union Army, I think does speak to a more moderate tone about slavery as well. Yeah, um, Tim, you want to add one more thing to that, don't you? So yeah, a little bit more about Grant and the slavery thing. So he did own, uh, acquired a slave from his father-in-law, uh, a 35-year-old man named William Jones. He was not, Grant was not an abolitionist at the time. He disliked slavery, but he couldn't bring himself to do, to force someone to do work. Uh, so after acquiring him in, towards the end of 1858, by Mar in March of 1859, Grant uh, freed him by a manumission deed, which was worth about $1,000. And this is in a period where Grant's pawning his watch to, to buy stuff and has very little money and certainly needed it. So his principles dictated that they do that. Um, and a little bit more about like his uh, politics. Grant, you know, he had tried to go in the real estate business and failed uh, in a partnership with Julia's brother. Uh, Julia actually recommended that they dissolve that. He then applies to be a county engineer, thinking his West Point education would would qualify him for that, which certainly would. Uh, but that was a political position and the free soilers and Republicans did, you know, thought that he shared his father-in-law's democratic sentiments and denied him for the position. Uh, you know, during his, you know, the civilian period of Grant's life, Grant casts his first presidential election ballot and he votes for James Buchanan. Though he would later say he was voting more against John C. Fremont and the Republicans believing that that platform would lead to the secession of uh, the southern states, and he wanted to avoid that. He wasn't overly political, but it is, as Nate mentioned by that point, he certainly uh, sympathizes more with uh, the northern Democrats. And he was not able to vote after moving to Galena, had not established residency uh, long enough to do so. Uh, but he stated that he would have supported uh, Stephen Douglas over Abraham Lincoln, but also would have supported Abraham Lincoln over the Southern Democrat, Democrat uh, John C. Breckinridge. So that kind of tells you where Grant's political sentiments were. He was definitely more for union above all and was not so much thinking um, uh, about slavery and the ultimate cause of the war, he wanted to to preserve the Union, which was something he shared in line with many Northern Democrats at the time. Anyway, that's where we leave that episode. We'll see you very soon. Cheers.
Remember, you can find links to our website and podcasts, as well as all of our social media pages in the show's description. A big thank you to Dr. Nathan Profos and Tim Wilgin. And a massive shout out and thank you to Cody C. Endow, who performed and allowed us to use his piece of violin music, Battle Cry of Freedom. Not only is Cody a musician, but he's also an author of a series of fictional novels set during the American Civil War. You'll find links to Cody's books in the show's description. Alternatively, you will also find them on Amazon. All that's left to say is thank you very much for listening to the Figures of the American Civil War podcast. Cheers.